This program is about free will and determinism, but with a difference, because one of the people in the program hasn't just an academic interest in determinism, it is, so to speak, his job. He's a psychologist with a worldwide reputation for devising a technique of controlling behavior known as operant conditioning, though he has reservations about the word conditioning. He is B.F. Skinner, professor of psychology at Harvard. And to talk to him about the presuppositions and morality of behavior control is Geoffrey Warnock, who is an Oxford philosopher, in fact, the principal of Hartford College, Oxford. Now, I'd like to start things off by putting a question to both of you. It's this. Suppose that somebody's way of behaving can be explained in terms of what you would call the contingencies of environmental reinforcement, but which is what I understand by rewards and punishments. Suppose you could explain his behavior in that way. What about the explanation which the chap himself might give in terms of his ideas and his purposes and his thoughts and so on? Would the causal explanation show that other explanation to be a bogus one? Yes, well, could we, could we take a specific example? Last evening, I went to the theater. Now, why? Well, I could tell you that I felt like going. It occurred to me, the idea of going to the theater occurred to me, and I went. I could also tell you that, um, looking at it from my professional point of view, that when I've gone to the theater in London, I've always been richly reinforced. That is to say, things have happened which have increased the likelihood that I will go to the theater when I'm in London. And uh, this would be the explanation that I would give. And I would say that that explanation would also explain why the idea of going to the theater occurred to me and why I felt like going. That suggests to me that you're less sharply and unqualifiedly critical of the sort of everyday terms in which we habitually explain human behavior than perhaps some of your readers might suppose. Um, if I, perhaps I might put the point like this. One's familiar from the history of science, or possibly pre-science, as one might call it, with the practice at one time of talking as if organisms such as, say, plants did things for purposes, that they grew in a certain way in order to seek the sunlight. And um, you say in your book, and um, I'm sure most people would agree, that that way of talking really is wholly non-explanatory. I and mean, it involves talking as if plants had thoughts and intentions in which they just don't. And one is genuinely explaining nothing. Now, I get the impression from what you were saying just now that you don't want to say exactly that anyway about the ordinary sort of story we would tell conversationally about why someone goes to the theatre. It isn't that this is a totally valueless, absolutely inapplicable kind of explanation, but you, you think just not a complete one or doesn't tell one the whole story. Well, there are two kinds of selection here. The, the plant turning to the light is a characteristic of plants which with, which evolved because those plants gained an advantage in survival. There were contingencies of survival which selected those plants which turned most effectively to the light. Mm -hmm. The purpose <clears throat> which used to be put ahead of the turning is now put afterward. It is the adaptation achieved by the plant in turning. And the same thing is true in operant behavior. That what used to be thought of as a creative, intentional act leading to behavior is now seen to be due to the selective effect of the consequences in strengthening behavior and making it more probable. So that the purpose of going to the theater turns out to be the consequences of having gone to the theater in the past, rather than something which leads me to go in this particular instance. Yes. But I suppose there's clearly no tendency in that um, towards the position that um, really intentions don't occur or there are no such things. I mean, uh, one could reasonably say in the case of the sunflower that it, this just doesn't have any purposes at all. 
Uh, whereas, of course, I, nothing in what you say, I think, would lead one to want to say that um, people don't actually have intentions in doing things or don't intend to do something and then go ahead and do it. I mean, it isn't that there's anything illusory in this. Well, but the difference between the sunflower and the person is that the person has also had a long experience in which he has learned to observe himself, particularly that private world within his skin to which no one else has access, which we are likely then to think of as being non-physical or something of that kind. But we have all learned from childhood to tell people what we are feeling, and what we are feeling is, I suppose, always a state of our body, or what we intend to do, or what we're going to do. And we have good evidence about this from the actual states of our bodies. And by reporting on our purpose, we seem to indicate a prior purpose, but what we report on is a disposition to act, which again is the product of an earlier set of consequences. So that we do not act because of a felt purpose, we act and beforehand feel a purpose, both for the same reasons which are to be found in the, in the past history. This is impossible for the sunflower. It has not learned to observe itself or to report on it what it is doing. It has no capacity for analyzing its behavior, where we have. We, and we, I, think, I think actually, by the experimental analysis of the role of the environment, we are discovering new kinds of self-observation, new kinds of self-knowledge. I think the thing which, where we, uh, the point where we differ is that uh, you, I believe, want to give some kinds of, of dimensions to these purposes, intentions, and so on, that I want to avoid. When I say the idea of going to the theater occurred to me, mm -hmm. what I should say, I believe, is that the, the behavior of going to the theater occurred to me. And well, that I went. Well, that occurred, yes. But why do you want to get away from saying the thought of going to the theater occurred to you? Because I'm worried about the dimensions of the thought. Uh, no doubt I could tell you in advance that I was going to go. In fact, I bought tickets and so on. Mm -hmm. So that I was aware of the probability that I would go. And uh, I was aware of the preparatory behaviors in which I engaged. Mm -hmm. But I want those to remain behavior, or at least uh, visible states of probabilities of behavior, which I can, being an introspective person, report. But I'm not reporting something in a different world, a mentalistic ah. world. Oh, well, I don't mind that, yes. I mean, I don't want there to be more than one world, any more than you do, I think, no. Well, I think we can agree, then. If that, if that is the case, then I believe we ought to look at the kinds of inferences which lead us to set up, uh, mm -hmm. the, uh, to, propose, to propose the existence of an idea or an intention or a purpose. What are, what are our, our, our evidences? And I would like to do it that way because I believe that gives me an advantage. I see. We are going yes. to be looking at the behavior and the, and the prior yes. conditions. Yes, I'm still not absolutely clear about this as to why why it should be that, that you want to get away from talking about people's thoughts uh, and uh, intentions. Because, I mean, it isn't the, obviously that one can attempt to deny that these actually occur. I mean, one is reporting something. I suppose it is that you want to say that the report that we ordinarily give is some kind of rather misleading cover for the really explanatory thing. Um, which uh, requires a different set of terms for its expression. Yes, it would be, f it would be unfair of me, Geoffrey, to uh, attribute to you all of the paraphernalia of mentalism and so on, but that did exist <laughs> at one time. And people gave explanations for physical action in terms of events in a non-physical world. And my feeling is that where there is more of that left uh, then we want to admit, and I am perhaps overdoing it by making it very clear that I, I don't want anything of it left, but I, uh, when I say that the idea of going to the theater occurred to me, mm -hmm. I, I, I'm very suspicious of what I have said then, because what, what has occurred has simply been behavior, the probability of behavior, 
the, the strength of which I was aware of before I acted because I am in touch with my own body. But it's my own body, and I'm very happy to, to hear you uh, say that you don't want to put any other kind of stuff in the body. That's, that's fine. This looks as if we were very, very much closer than I had supposed. But could I now uh, turn over to the other side of this? Let's say the, the morality of controlling right. behavior by conditioning. Now, you uh, are in the business of controlling people's behavior, well, people as well as animals. Um, to what ends? Yes, but that involves an, a third example of selection. So far as I can see, the human species has evolved various cultures, that is to say, social environments in which the individual has an extraordinary advantage as against life entirely in solitude. Solitude produces the feral child, the wild boy, and that's all. But with a culture, human behavior can do fantastic things because the culture stores the past experience of the, of, and, and, and makes it for a much more favorable environment. Now, I believe that cultures evolve. The direction is not necessarily predictable in advance, but to some extent, we can distinguish between cultures which make people effective and those which destroy. And I believe that it is always the strength of the culture and its ultimate survival which is the value, which answers the question of, of the moral, of the morals lying behind the control of behavior. I want to build better contingencies of reinforcement in the classroom so that uh, the students learn more rapidly and effectively. And I, I, the reasons I would give have to do with the, the chances that this culture can solve its problems effectively. But yes, what I, I think myself would feel here is that this is going to lead into enormously more controversial territory, perhaps, than you have recognized. You see, I'm reminded here of um, a uh, former and distinguished thinker, namely the philosopher Hobbes, um, who, like you, I suppose, could be described as a materialist. You wouldn't mind that. No, uh, was no. certainly a determinist, no. and certainly believed, he didn't know as much about it as you do, but he certainly believed that the way people behave could be controlled by yeah. um, supplying the appropriate conditions for them. But now, Hobbes, in that enormous work of his called Leviathan, yes. of course, was very conscious that this led him directly into fundamental political problems. Right. Um, if it's the case that we have what you call a technology of behavior, if that's to say it is possible effectively to get people to behave in this way or that, then surely there arises an enormous range of what are partly political, partly moral questions about um, through what institutions this sort of control is to be exercised, to what ends, ends selected by whom, yes. and all the, these are enormously difficult questions which are bound to get one into I should have thought political argument of a very well, fundamental kind. I, I agree, it does, and I not only recognize, I have other people point them out uh, <laughs> again and again. Um, this, is, uh, this is the problem, and it is not, I think, a, the result of something being wrong in the formulation, but rather mm -hmm. in the fact that survival is a very difficult value. How can one predict the uh, exigencies to be encountered by a culture or a state or, or a political organization yes. or an economic system? How can one prescribe the behaviors that are most effectively going to contend uh, with these conditions? That's where the trouble comes, and that's why you have different political philosophies, different systems mm -hmm. of economics, and so on. Yes. But that is nothing that I can do anything about. We are all in the same boat on that. We all have difficulties. In, in deciding what is to be done, and but I, I, if I have any expertise at all, I, I claim it's in the field of how to do it after one decides. Ah, uh, yes, to, yes. Ah, uh, that would mean that you would maintain the distinction, which I suppose people would tend to take for granted, between possessing a technology and determining how it is to be applied. Absolutely. 
except that I do not believe that the second requires any special wisdom denied to the scientist and available to the philosopher. Uh, I know, but possibly it isn't either solved by any special expertise possessed well, by that's the scientist. That's, uh, <laughs> however, we ought to be able to analyze human behavior as it tries to deal with the difficulties in the field of, 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 yes. of moral judgment, value judgments. Yes. I, I, again, I trust you would still go along that, 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 the, that the moral is not a different world. It is, it is the world we are living in. It has something to do with practical problems in that world. We're not moving into another kind of atmosphere or another uh, spiritual condition or anything no. of that kind. We're, we're solving practical problems somehow or other with, with whatever is, uh, is yes. available. Yes. There is some one other point at which I'm not saying that Hobbes, to go back to him, is in a stronger position than you are, but I think he is in a clearer position. I mean, he was clear that the overriding value which we ought to try and secure was personal survival of the individual, that this was the thing yes. that really should be uh, aimed at above all things. Well, at least I understand quite clearly what Hobbes means when he says yes. that. Whereas I, I might say this may simply be that it needs further explanation, but the notion of the survival of a culture I find very much more difficult to understand. I mean, yes. how one is to identify a culture, what would count as its surviving or not surviving. And, um, because presumably cultures are always undergoing processes of change. Well, when does change amount to not surviving? Uh, changes in culture, yes. Uh, now, I think that raises the question as to what changes in a culture are desirable. And how is that question to be settled, because you can't answer it in terms of the survival of that culture. You can only answer it to the extent that you can predict some of the contingencies of survival which are to be met by the culture, and that's a very difficult thing. Survival is a, a very weak sort of value for predictive purposes, but we can still make some decisions. There are some kinds of things which simply must be changed now if we are to prevent disaster with overpopulation, uh, using up of resources, pollution of the environment, and so on. We're not precisely sure how the culture would perish if we did nothing about this. But we have a pretty good, pretty good idea of the kinds of changes we need to make. We need, we need to, uh, to, to change practices which are continuing trends in certain directions. But I don't think, does it, that that fully answers the, the, the question that Godfrey was raising. You see, he, he raised the question, what changes in a culture are desirable? And I, if I understood what you said, you were saying that, well, um, changes in a culture are pretty unpredictable or difficult to predict. But even if we could predict them, we would still have to decide which of them we wanted to try and bring about, would we not? Well, this is a matter of priority. You mean which one we should tackle first or something of that kind with available facilities? Well, like, not just well, priority, I think. I mean, supposing we all would agree that we want to avoid some sort of major collapse and cataclysm. Yes. I mean, everybody would agree about that. But given that we're all agreed in av avoiding that, uh, there are surely a large number of options and different kinds of culture. Yes all of which would count as survivals in one way or another of our culture. But I think it's a mistake to get tangled up in the question of values. I don't know. I seem mm. to be able to set up values which seem to be perfectly reasonable. And I, I really don't see any debate. For example, I think it, we could say that a culture will be stronger if every person in it capable of working has a job, that he likes what he does, and he works well and carefully. I think that, that seems to me so obvious that a culture is better off if that is the case. I think it's terribly important that educational systems be available so that young people acquire what they need to learn as quickly and efficiently as possible. Now, I think there are questions as to what they ought to learn. But even that, I think, is not the kind of thing that one can't say something about. I think we're much better if we get along with each other without war. And uh, I, I should, should put that first, perhaps, as, as, as a value. And I really don't want to quibble about whether it might not, in some sense, be better if the world were continuously at war. 
Ah, nobody's going to disagree with you about that, certainly. And I, I've, I go further than that. I mean, I would entirely agree with you that there is an enormous range of extremely important agreement as to what states yeah. of affairs oh, yes. are desirable and, if possible, to be brought about and not. I think perhaps the difference between us would amount to your being more hopeful of procuring general assent to um, certain propositions about the desirability of a kind of culture than I would. I mean, I would think that there would be more residual disagreement, I mean, pure differences of mm. taste, perhaps. Well, it might be that, or it might be a temperament or something of that kind, but I think also, and I, I'm, I'm not saying this to boast at all, but the particular specialty in which I've, to which I've devoted my life has given me a very great reason to believe that changes can be brought about that we used to think impossible. Now, I'm not, uh, not pulling rank on you on this at all, but I, I, I would attribute my optimism to some rather substantial demonstrations that things can be done that we used to think impossible. Yes. Still going to leave us with the question whether we should do them or not. But, um... Yes, I think <sighs> that uh, is a question, and uh, if I am convinced that we should, then it is up to me to apply my behavioral engineering to convince you and others and get them done. I'd and rather you try to persuade them. Supposing that would actually happen, <laughs> that would be a demonstration then that our culture has somehow or other created conditions under which something is done to, yes. to move the culture in a given direction. Now, if the culture then perishes, so much the worse for the culture, but at least it was an evolutionary try in one direction. Some yes. other culture will come up with something better. Yes. Could I bring up a related, a slightly different point? You, you talked just now about moving the culture in a given direction, and um, of course, in your statement of your position, you very often use the word control, the notion yes. of controlling the environment and thereby controlling the behavior of people. Um, now, I th I'm sure that a great many of um, the readers of your books would get the impression from this that what you envisaged was a kind of mastermind, a master manipulator, um, occupying somewhat the relation to humanity at large as the man in the white coat occupies to the laboratory pigeon. And a great many people, I'm sure, find this an unattractive picture. Very much so. I do myself. Now, I think that the, the, a person who begins to understand behavior in a more effective way will function as some kind of specialist who will give advice but will not himself actually put it into effect. All I foresee is that teachers will teach more effectively, uh, people who arrange incentive conditions will arrange more effective incentive conditions. If there's any com controlling power, it will remain where it is now, but I should like to suppose that a culture will evolve in which it is impossible for concentrations of power uh, to, to make dictators possible. I would suppose that it, the future does not lie in any one man benevolent or otherwise, mm -hmm. but in a culture which is the ultimate determiner of what kind of men emerge in power to make use of available scientific yes. knowledge. Well, I, I think these political questions could take a whole other debate. So on that note, we'll have to end. Fred Skinner, Jeffrey Warnock, thank you. <laughs>